welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Honor the Lord, and if you have the ability, stand to your feet, and I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we have access to come into the throne room of grace and to approach your throne, Father, tonight by your blood. God, we thank you, Lord, for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which bought us, which brought us into a new life, God, and and we're so grateful and thankful that we can come tonight and open up your word openly, freely. God, that we can learn of you. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, and the direction that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. I pray that we would have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand, Lord. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And and Father God, we pray that it produces something in each and every one of our individual lives as we diligently adhere to and obey your word. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it on the church worldwide, all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that you would bless them as you would bless us this night. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Grab your Bibles, and and, and if you want to open them up somewhere, you might want to just open it up right to the beginning, open it up to the book of Genesis, because we're going to start there with something. And this is the blood, part number one. It's going to be a four-part series talking about the blood. Now, a question comes to mind. Why discuss the blood of Jesus? Isn't it enough for you and I just to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that he did shed blood? But the problem with just knowing that on a surface level is is when you read the Bible, you will encounter numerous verses throughout the Bible, hundreds of verses, in fact, that talk about the blood. And so the Bible is making a huge deal about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just by volume, but also by the statements and the claims that it makes when it comes to the blood. And so if we're going to have a good understanding of the blood, we've got to start with the start, and we've got to find out what God is talking about when it comes to this thing called the blood. Looking at the beginning of Genesis, you remember the story, God created the heavens and the earth. He creates man and woman, places them in the garden, gives them a job assignment, and also gives them a commandment. Now there is a rule that they must obey, which is not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. You know the story, they were deceived. Eve Eve was deceived by the serpent. She entered into disobedience by eating the fruit, gave it to her husband who was with her, and he willfully rebelled against the commandment of God. And in doing so, just as the Lord had said, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so the punishment, the penalty for their sin was death. Spiritual death took place. The Bible says that their eyes were open. Now all of a sudden they were like God in the fact that they could see and they knew good and evil. They saw that they were naked. And remember what they did? They, they went and they, they showed some fig leaves together, right? And, and, and they showed these fig leaves together and made themselves some fig leaf briefs, you know, and, and a fig leaf t-shirt. And, and, and they were covering themselves up with fig leaves, Right? And so they hide when they hear the voice of the Lord in the garden. God is walking through the garden in the cool of the day, and they hide from, from the Lord. They're cowering in shame, and they're, and they're trying to hide themselves from the presence of God. And God says, hey, where are you guys at? Come on out. And, and, and so they say, we, we were afraid because we were naked. And he says, who told you you were naked? And you remember, now all of a sudden, the, 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 the whole thing is exposed before the Lord, and God already knew what was going on, but he 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 he. he comes to them and and, and he starts to pronounce what's going to take place now is the consequence of their action. And they were in a fallen state. And therefore, the Lord made a provision for their sin. God gave them something in order to take care of their sin for a period of time. Take a look at it with me in Genesis chapter 3. Very interesting. Maybe you've read this verse before. But maybe you never saw it. I know the first time I realized what was really going on here, my eyes were open. I said, wow, that's amazing that God would do that. Genesis chapter 3, after everything is all said and done, the judgments are pronounced, the curse is pronounced on the serpent, the the first prophecy of Jesus Christ comes forth. There's an amazing verse that takes place in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 21. And it says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. 
Previously, they had made themselves some clothes. They went and they grabbed some fig leaves, right? And they sewed them together and they, and, and they put them on trying to cover themselves. And, and, and they didn't want their, their nakedness to be exposed. But God said, that's not good enough. Your efforts to cover up your sin is not going to work. It's also not going to last. And it doesn't make any provision for what happened. So what did the Lord do? He made tunics of skin. Now, now we read a verse like that, and we think that God broke out his little sewing machine and, and, and went and got some fabric from the store and made some, some tunics, and we're kind of like, what is a tunic? Well, it, it's like a robe. It covers the person completely. But let me ask you a question for a second. Where did God get skin? Had to be from the animals, right? Because there was only Adam and Eve and the animal kingdom on the face of the earth at that time. Now, remind me, Adam had a job, right? Tending the garden. And also, God brought every animal in front of Adam, and Adam named the animals. And God was looking over his shoulder watching to see what Adam would name the animals. P put yourself in the garden for a second. Now, all of a sudden, here you are. You're in the garden. God is bringing the animals before you. And, and, and it's an exciting time. And every new animal comes up. And, and, and there's, wow, look at this long-necked, crazy looking. Look at the spots and, and the, that giraffe, you know. And it moves on. And now all of a sudden, this, this little teeny tiny thing comes up. And it's kind of just fluttering there. And there's this little sound of wings. And, mm, a hummingbird. My good, yeah, yeah, come on through. And, and, and then some funky looking thing comes up. And it's got a duck bill. But you don't even know a duck bill platypus, you know. And so you're naming the animals and they come across. But you know each and every one of them by name. Maybe God had brought dogs and, and, and cattle and, and, and the reptiles and everything else in front of Adam. And, and, and there may have been one that was a very gentle creature that came in front of Adam. Soft, woolly hair. Just followed. Not very smart. But just stayed kind of close to him. Maybe it was a lamb. And now Adam has fallen. The judgments are pronounced. There's been a curse that's been made. And all of a sudden there has to be a provision made for their sin. The penalty for sin was death. God knew that man couldn't stay in this condition, so he kicked him out of the garden lest he eat of the tree of life and stay in that fallen condition. But now God does something. He makes tunics of skin. Maybe God brought that lamb that Adam had named. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud right now. But Jesus Christ was called the spotless lamb slain before the foundation of the world for you and I. God knew what was going to take place. God knew what was going to happen. And God prophetically spoke that Jesus Christ would come into the earth and take care of once and for all the sin issue in our life. But in order to get to that point, he had to give us a picture of it. He had to give us the calling card. And that was in the blood of an innocent life. Here's, here's the provision. An innocent life was given for a guilty one. That lamb that was slain there, that was the innocent life. It was a substitutional life given in place of the guilty party. And that blood that was shed was poured out and was given in place of the guilty party. Jesus Christ, in the same way, took our punishment. He, he, he took our sin upon him. The wrath of God for mankind, past, present, and future, was poured out on Jesus on the cross. His innocent life was given. His blood was shed for you and I. An innocent life for a guilty one. Oh, thank God. That he knew what he was doing. Thank God that he took care of the sin issue. Thank God that he did something. It didn't leave us in that fallen state forever. But that God brought you and I into a new relationship with him. Now we see this in what the Bible defines as a, a, a word called atonement. Maybe you've heard of the day of atonement, right? And, and, and God had given them something in this atonement, he brought forth what was called the law. And in this system called the law, God speaks something to the children of Israel and shows them something about the blood. You're there in Genesis, turn past Exodus, 
and, and go to the next book called Leviticus. And we're going to go to Leviticus chapter number 17. In Leviticus chapter number 17, we're going to take a look at one verse, verse number 11. God is further unfolding this revelation about the blood and showing you and I what it is that he wants to do with the blood. Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 11 says these words. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now in the Old Testament, that word atonement meant covering. It meant that the issue was covered for that year. Once a year, they would come and they would bring a perfect spotless lamb. And the high priest would slaughter that lamb and he would catch the blood in a bowl. They would completely burn the rest of that lamb. It was just completely burnt up and its ashes were carried outside of the camp. He would take that blood and he would set it aside. He would wash himself, wash his garments. He would change his clothes. And then he would take that blood into the presence of the Lord. And he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it here. He would sprinkle it there over all the instruments of the tabernacle where they met up with the Lord. And then he would go into the most holy place. The place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And there on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was what was called the mercy seat. It, it, it was the cover over the Ark of the Covenant. And there inside the Ark of the Covenant were some items, and, and we don't have time to get into all that, but they represented the rejection of, uh, uh, by man of God's leadership, of his laws, and of his provision. And, and so once a year, they would carry this blood into that place, and over that rejection, over that sin, uh, over that trespass, they would sprinkle the blood of that innocent lamb on the mercy seat. Turning that seat from one that should have been a seat of judgment, now into a seat of mercy. And the sins of the nation for that year were atoned for. Or in other words, they were covered. When God looked down, he no longer saw that, he re that rejection. But now he saw that there was a covering over that in the blood of an innocent life. An innocent life was given for the guilty nation. That was God's plan. That was what God said. It would be like you and I today coming in and up here on the, on the platform is, is some carpet. And let's say that on this carpet I had some oil, some black crude oil. I'll just change the oil in my car. And I brought that oil out and I just stained this carpet, just, just rubbed it all around, right, all on the, and, and just got it, you know, right up in there and, and, and worked it all in. And we had this nasty, ugly, dark oil stain all on the carpet. And we decided that we were going to make atonement for that oil stain. And so what we did was we took a rug, and we took that rug, and we just put it right over the oil stain. Now, let me ask you a question. Have we taken care of the issue? Why not? The oil's still there, right? All we did was we swept the issue under the rug, right? Next year comes around, and the, and the oil has seeped up through the rug, and we realize, oh, we're still messed up. So we get rid of that rug, right, and we pull out a new rug, all right, and we just put it right over that oil spot. Have we taken care of the issue yet? No, we have not. It's still there, still coming through year after year, time after time. See, that was what was going on in the nation of Israel. God had given them something that would take care of the issue once a year. That high priest, year after year after year after year, would go into the presence of God with the blood of a sacrifice, an, intimate, an innocent lamb that was slain. And he would sprinkle that blood. And even after his lifetime, his son would carry on the tradition, and his son would carry on the tradition throughout the ages until Jesus Christ came and he poured out his own blood. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, you know where the book of Hebrews is? Hebrews chapter number 9 talks about what Jesus Christ did as our new high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse number 11, we're going to read through verse number 14. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 11, reading through verse number 14, says this. It says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. In other words, Jesus didn't go into the earthly temple. He didn't go into the earthly tabernacle, that tent of meeting where they sprinkled the blood on the atonement. On that, on that mercy seat. He didn't go there. No, Jesus Christ, when he died spiritually, he went into heaven for you and I. Verse number 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once 
for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, we'll come back to that word redemption in a moment. Verse 13, for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies or sets apart as holy for the purifying of the flesh. Verse 14, how much more? Oh, come on, somebody. You got to get a hold of this tonight. You got to get into this tonight. We're talking about you. We're talking about me. We're talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What did that just say? That just said that all of your sin is now taken care of. No longer is it just swept under the rug for one more year. No, now Jesus Christ comes having obtained eternal redemption. And when Jesus went to the mercy seat in heaven and he sprinkled his blood, God no longer looks down on the earth and sees that rejection. If you are now in Christ Jesus, God takes a look at you and he takes a look at me and he sees the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over the top of us. He no longer sees that old, stinky, sinful self. No, now God sees the saint of God. Now now God sees the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over you and I, and now he sees that there was an innocent life that was given for the guilty party, and now that judgment that should have been poured out on us, he knows was poured out on Christ, and now God has mercy on you and I. Our sins are forgiven. They're taken care of in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, we find out that atonement no longer means Covering, no, now it means something else. It means this word called exchange. Now, it's almost as if Jesus Christ came along and he saw the issue and he said, wait, wait a second, there's some oil seeping through this rug. He throws the rug off and he goes, oh, look at this rug. Look at this carpet. And what does he do? He rips out the carpet. He disposes of the old carpet and now he lays down brand new carpet. Has he taken care of the issue, church? Yes, he has. Now you and I are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's who you and I are in Christ Jesus. Now, I said we were going to get back to that word called redemption. Because Jesus Christ came and he redeemed us. The Bible says he obtained eternal redemption. Now, we, we don't use that word redemption very much. We think of it as like I turned in a soda can and, and, and it was a California redemption value of five cents, right? And, and we think you turn it in and you get five cents back. Not very valuable. Not, not very exciting. Not, not real cool. Wow, Jesus, you obtained a five cent worth of me, right? That, that's that's kind of cool. That's kind of neat. But that's not what the Bible is talking about. God did not go and turn in some soda cans for you and I. No, Jesus Christ went to the cross, poured out his blood. I think that's worth a whole lot more than five cents. And the Bible, when it talks about this word called redemption, is not talking about turning in soda cans. The Bible, when it talks about redemption, is going into so much more. Redemption is defined by, uh, I looked it up in the dictionary, the Encarta Dictionary. It means the act of saving something or somebody from a declined, dilapidated, or corrupted state and restoring it, him or her, to a better condition. That's what Jesus Christ did. We were broke down, busted, and disgusted, and you and I know it. We're a bunch of dirt bags. We were out there, and we couldn't save ourselves. And what did he do? He took us out of that pit. He took us out of the gutter. He raised us up with him, and he put us in a new state. Well, what else does it mean? Well, it means that uh, it, it improved the state of somebody or something saved from apparently irreversible decline. See, if we would have kept on the path that we were on, it, it, it would have been irreversible. It, that decline would have went straight into the pit of hell. And you and I were on the edge, about ready to fall in, when Jesus Christ, his love broke through, and the grace of God got a hold of our lives and raised us up, put our feet upon the rock, cleaned us up, and made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, in secular Greek, we find out something more. In secular Greek, this word was a word used of buying slaves freedom. Oh, you got to get a hold of this. Buying slaves freedom. What does that mean? That means that in the marketplace in that day, they were trading slaves. And there were some masters that would go out and they would look at these slaves. They would start to take a look at them. They would see, you know, whether or not they were strong, whether or not they were fit. They'd open up their mouth and look at their teeth and see if they were rotting out or see if they were healthy. 
And they would see, you know, they, they would kind of test them a little bit, smack them and see how they took it, you know. And, and they would see whether or not that was a good slave. See whether or not that slave would be one that they would want to purchase. And they would take a look and, and, and they would see whether or not they, they would do a good job for them. And so if the people who were selling the slaves saw that they were taking interest in that one particular slave, they would jack up the price. And they would start to make that price so great that they knew that they were going to get a hold of it. Why? Because they didn't want just any slave. They wanted that slave. And they knew that if that's the slave that they wanted, that they could get a greater value, a greater worth out of that slave. Why? Because healthy, because responsive, because strong, because the needs that they had at that time in that slave, they were going to find that in that slave. So they would jack up the price. And they would go to auction and they would start to say, well, we're going to start it out not at $100, but $1,000, $1,000. Do I have a thousand, thousand here, a thousand? Okay, two thousand, two thousand, and right. And they would get those prices going to astronomical figures so that they could make more money. They would buy that slave for their use. But other people would come to the marketplace and they would buy those slaves not for their own personal use, but to set them free. They would see those slaves in that condition and their hearts would go out to them and they would feel for them because they realized that these were human beings and they would take them and they would buy them and they would give them their freedom. There's another definition from secular Greek and that was of a conqueror releasing prisoners. When two nations were at war, maybe, maybe a battalion had went in and, and they were at war and this battalion got captured. And here they were in the stronghold of the enemy, and they were captured, and they were in lockdown. They were in prison, and they could not get themselves out. But their king came with the rest of the nation and came and gained a victory over them. And that king would come in and would free all of those prisoners that were being held captive. That was redemption. Now let's take a look at it for you and I. Jesus Christ came to this earth saw the human condition, saw that we were enslaved to the devil, saw that we were enslaved to our lust and to every evil thing, to every evil desire, and that we couldn't get our own freedom. We couldn't pay the price that needed to be paid. And the devil saw that Jesus Christ was looking at you and I. And so the devil took a look and he said, oh, you want to get a hold of it? Oh, well, hey, Jesus, and you, you, you got to pay this price. you got to bow down and worship me. I'll give you, I'll give you the authority. Well, turn these stones into bread, right? And he tempts him all throughout his life. But then he saw that Jesus was really serious about this purchase. And so he jacked the price up because he knew that the real price was blood, that it had to be the entire life, the entire person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ willingly, knowingly went, and he paid the price for you and I to be set free. He didn't want us enslaved to the devil any longer, so what did he do? He poured out his life, and he paid the ultimate price for you and I. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there because you and I not only were slaves, but also we were captives. You and I had been taken captive, and we were in a prison. We were in a bondage. And we couldn't get ourselves out. But our King Jesus came. And when he bled and when he died on the cross and he was raised again to life, he gained the ultimate victory. And now he has set all the captives free and led them in his train up to heaven where he's poured his blood on the mercy seat for you and I. And now we are free. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Tonight, with those thoughts in mind, I want to take a look at what it means to be blood-bought, blood-bought. As we go throughout this series, we'll take a look at some other things about the blood, different aspects. But tonight, thinking about redemption, thinking about Jesus buying us our freedom, Jesus coming and conquering, what does it mean to be blood-bought? A couple of things that we're going to take a look at tonight. Number one, what it means to be blood-bought is that I have value to God. I have value to God. I, I, I hope these words sink into your thinking because so many people, especially in this area, especially in this time, this day and age, don't think that they have any value at all. They've allowed themselves to be used and abused. Their parents left them. Their brothers and sisters hated them. Their best friends turned their backs on them. And they've been used and abused by men and women, by bosses, by people who they thought 
were going to come through for them, and they ended up disappointed, and now they feel that they have no value. And the devil's been lying to them, whispering in their ear, you're nothing but a slave. You're no, you'll never amount to anything. You're, you're not going to do anything. You're stupid. You're ugly. You, 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 what are you even trying for? Why don't you just end it all? And yet Jesus paid the ultimate price for you. And you have value to God. Doesn't matter if you have value to me. Doesn't matter if you have value to the person next to you or your parents or your brother, your relatives, your neighbors. Doesn't matter. Why? Because the king of the universe valued you so much that he went to the cross and he died in your place. You see, value is determined by how much somebody will pay for something. Think about it. If you're going to go and buy a house, what do you do? You start to work the numbers. You put in an offer, and you lowball that offer so that they'll come down on theirs. You come up a little bit until you get to that price. The actual value of that house is how much you actually will pay for it. See, if they come down to here and they stop and they say, no, we believe the value is greater than what you're going to put in, and you stop, you didn't value that house to that degree. Now, Jesus Christ could have said, well, you know what? I'll come to earth and I'll live, but I'm only going to die a natural death. That's how much I value these people. Jesus Christ could have said, well, you know what? I'll create a whole bunch of gold and silver, or I'll create an alternate reality, or I'll do something else. And he could have only valued us that much. But let me tell you something for a second, church. Jesus did not blood borrow. No, he blood bought. He, he, he didn't go and, and, and borrow some of this and borrow some, and, and, and therefore, here's your value. I borrowed this in order to purchase. No, Jesus' blood bought. Think about this one. Jesus didn't blood barter. Okay, devil, all right, I'll, I'll give you some, some, some you know, little angels to worship you, and I'll give you your own little corner over there. Just give me the people. No, he didn't blood barter. He paid full sticker price for you and I. He looked at the sticker price, right? You ever been to a car dealership? You look at it, and, they, and what do you say? Oh, no, that's just MSRP. I'm not paying that. Ain't no way I'm going to pay that much for that car, right? Why? Because that's not the value. But Jesus came to you and I, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to pay it all. I, I'm going to go after not just the low price. I'm not going to barter them down. I'm not going to work this deal. No, no, there was no blood bartering. It was blood buying. Jesus blood bought you and I. Finally, Jesus didn't blood bargain. He didn't come and say, well, you know what? Okay, I'll, I'll get this many for this price, and, and, you know, that'll be good enough. No, Jesus suffered. He shed his blood, and he purchased our redemption. Let's take a look at it in the Word together. First Peter chapter 1. You're there in Hebrews. Turn a couple books back. Right past James is the book of First Peter. First Peter chapter 1. We're going to take a look at verse number... 18 and verse number 19. While you're turning there, everybody say, I have value to God. Oh, come on, say it again. I have value to God. Doesn't that feel good to say? Amen. My goodness. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 18 and verse number 19. It says these words. It says, knowing. We ought to know this stuff. If the Bible says knowing... We ought to know it. What should we know? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. From your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19. But, in other words, but you were bought with this. What were you and I bought with? But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You and I were blood-bought, and that means I have value to God. Say it one more time. I have value to God. God. What does it mean to be blood-bought? Number one, it means that I have value to God. Number two, it means that I have forgiveness from God. Oh, that's a good one. We're going to take a look at this uh, when we get together and we talk about being blood-washed or blood-bathed. But I have forgiveness from God. The Bible is very clear that when Jesus Christ shed his blood, that it was for our redemption, and it brought in forgiveness of sins. That everything that we had ever done wrong, past, present, and future, that it was taken care of in the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at it in the Word, Ephesians chapter 1. Turn there with me to Ephesians, the first chapter. 
And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7, says these words. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7 says, In him we have redemption. We have that purchase price. We were bought out of slavery. We were freed as being captives. In him we have redemption through his blood. And then look at what it says. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, I remember being a, a, a child, and, and somebody was telling me that God was writing down everything that I ever did. But they went on to say, just the bad stuff. God's writing down every bad thing that you ever do. And it scared me. Because I said, number one, why is God so concerned with me? And number two, why is he only writing down the bad stuff? And as I grew up, I almost had that mentality that God was always lurking around waiting to catch me in an offense, you know, like God was, was this cosmic killjoy lurking around the corner, wanting to make sure that I didn't have any fun. And, and growing up, I, I kind of had that always hanging over my head, that I had to be good and I had to do things right because God's watching and God's going to write it down. And I never understood that. But did you know that the Bible does say that God takes down a record of what's done here on the earth, that God is watching the events here on the earth, but not just to get us. God's not looking to zap us. God doesn't have some two by four waiting to hit us in the head when we mess up. No, God is looking out to show himself strong on behalf of those who love him and those who are believing in him in faith. The Bible says that if we do mess up, that Jesus Christ provided in his blood the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. First John 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now again, we'll look at this in depth when we take a look at what it means to be blood-bathed. But I found this cool verse in, in the book of Colossians. You're there in Ephesians. Turn a couple books over. Ephesians, then turn past Philippians. And then you'll find Colossians chapter number 1. I'm sorry, chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And we're going to take a look at verse 13 and verse number 14. Colossians chapter number 2, verse 13 and verse number 14. And it says, and you, it's talking about us. You, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Notice it didn't say some. Think about that for a second. It didn't say most of them. It didn't say, you know, just the really bad ones or only the, the ones that weren't, weren't all that bad, but that, that, that terrible stuff that you did, God is still hanging that. No, it says all. It says all. Now take a look at verse number 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. Now, very interesting, those, those words, the handwriting. The handwriting. This was a term used of like a ledger. Kind of like every time you did something that was contrary to the ways of God, that would be seen by God as evil, that there was a ledger in heaven and, and it was taken down, it was written, there was a note taken of it, and there was a price that had to be paid for that sin. Remember, the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. So there was a handwriting that was written down of things that were against you and I. Oh, yeah, this is, this is Bible right here. You just read it for yourself. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. In other words, everything that we were doing that was sowing into that sin nature, the, the, the evil things that we were producing in our life was going to add up to a big old debt that we couldn't pay called death. And it was getting stacked up against us. But Jesus Christ saw that we had an outstanding bill. And Jesus Christ said, oh, no, no, no. They're covered by my blood. I'll take care of their tab. And what did he do? He took his blood and he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid your tab. Remember one time my wife and I were eating some lunch, 
We were over there at Mimi's and we, we had ordered everything that day. We were hungry and we had our kids with us and we didn't care what they ate. And it was one of those days we said, we are going to treat ourselves. Man, we're just going to go all out today. Oh, you, you want this? Oh, please bring it on. You want an extra brand month? Oh, sure. Side salad? Br come on. And, and extra dressing and, and a side of that corn chowder stuff. I don't even care. Just bring and, and, and a coffee. And, and oh, did we save room for dessert? Why, yes, we did. Bring it on, right? <laughs> we ordered everything. And at the end of our meal, the server came over with a smile and said, hey, hey, your friend over there, that gentleman over there took care of your bill already. And my wife and I went, oh, we wouldn't have ordered everything if we knew he was paying. Man, we feel bad now. But isn't that the picture of God? That God saw what little piggies we were wallowing in the mud, just having a good old time in our sin. And he saw that we were going for it, right? You want dessert? Yeah, bring it on. I saved room. And Jesus says, I'm going to pay their bill. And he was happy to do it. He paid for it all. Now listen, that doesn't give you a license to sin. Now that you're saved, now that you're blood bought, now you are bought with a price. Let's take a look at it. Because what it means to be blood bought, number one, it means I have value to God. Number two, it means I have forgiveness from God. And number three, last thing for tonight, is that I have a place with God. Maybe you've been cast out. Maybe you've been cast aside. Maybe you've been cast down. Maybe they even kicked you while you were down and said, get out of here. You don't belong here. You've been rejected by men, rejected by family, rejected by employers. You know, there's a lot of rejection going around right now. And yet God says that we have such a value that he would go and pay the penalty for you and I. He would pay the price with his blood. That he would forgive us our sins, he would clean us up, and not only that, but now God would give us a place with him. Oh my goodness. Think about it, church. This is not just talking about in heaven in the sweet by and by that someday I'll fly away and I'll get to be with Jesus, even though that is a reality. And even though we rejoice at the thought of that, no, God has given us a place here and now by his blood. I have a place with God. He spilled his blood and laid down his body so that we could become his body. Wow. Let me say that again because that's a pretty profound statement. He spilled his blood and laid down his body so that we could become his body. Acts chapter 20. Turn there with me. Acts chapter number 20. And in Acts chapter number 20... Looking at verse number 28. The Apostle Paul is about ready to go on a, a journey that he knows is going to be a tough one. He's saying goodbye to some close friends, to some of the leaders of a church. In Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, he says these words to them. But really, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and I today. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. Look at this. Which he purchased with his own blood. Now look at those words that I've highlighted up on the overhead. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Sometimes when we get saved, we get born again, and we go into a church, we think, ah, I don't know these people. It's a sea of faces. Everybody looks a little different. Some of these people look scary. Some of them look nice, but even in their niceness, they look scary to me, you know? And, 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 and there's almost this kind of thing like, you know, I don't know if I fit. I don't know if I have a place here. Listen, you are never a stranger in your father's house. This is the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I'm not talking exclusively of us. But every church that's out there that names the name of Jesus Christ, that's preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the body of Christ here on the earth now, that is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. You and I have a place with God now because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us 
entrance the king has called for us. He wants us to come and sit at his table. He wants us to be a part of the family. Now you are a part of the household of faith. This is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Last verse for tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I started to take a look at this subject. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, last verse for tonight, verse number 20. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, for you were bought at a price. Verse number 20, you were bought at a price. The price was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Listen, you're not your own anymore. No, you were blood bought. Just like that slave that was in the market, even though Jesus Christ came and purchased you and gave you freedom from that slave market, now he's brought you into the family. No longer a slave, no, now a son. But as a son, because you were bought at a price, therefore, in other words, because of what I just said, because Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and I, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What does God want from you and I? Well, now that he has given all of his heart and life for you and I. He requires nothing less of us. God wants all of our hearts and all of our lives lived for him each and every day. Tonight, a couple of things we learned, what it means to be blood-bought. Number one is that I have value to God. Everybody say, I have value to God. God. Number two, I have forgiveness from God. Go ahead and say it. And number three is I have a place with God. Go ahead and say it. Come on, if you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, give him a great big praise. You guys were great tonight. I just want to thank you for listening and for getting a hold of that with me tonight. God is so good to us. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure before anybody leaves, just, just take a moment. It's okay. Just take, take a moment with me and focus in because for some of you in this room, this is the most important part of tonight, but also the most important part of your life. The reason why I say that is because we've examined the blood of Jesus. We've heard how the blood has bought us, takes care of us, wipes away our sins. My goodness. It gets us out of a position we couldn't get ourselves out of. There was nothing that we could do. You know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get into heaven. You can't save yourself. No amount of good works or doing good deeds is going to help you. Heard one guy tell me one time, oh, I'm working on my resume trying to do a lot of good stuff because I used to do a lot of bad stuff. Listen, that's not going to get you into heaven. doesn't matter how much good you do. Remember, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good because the standard is perfection and the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So I want you to take a moment and examine yourself. What makes you think that you're going to get to go to heaven? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you. And God. Sometimes people think, well, I, I went to church growing up. And, and my parents took me to church and told me we were Christians. We, we attended those religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe even Sabbath school class. Your parents hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck and had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. I mean, everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that going to church, being raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, and that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere in the Bible do I see that it says America is a Christian nation and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. Simply does not work like that. And again, do you think that God sees that you're not some other religion? So by default, he just says, oh, well, you don't fit here or here. So I'm going to lump you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. So it doesn't work like that. Sometimes people would say, well, not only was a child that I go to church, but here I am sitting in church tonight, Pastor, sitting right here in front of you. And I'm a Christian. I, I, I go to church. I'm in church all the time. Yeah, that's great. But could you show that to me in the Bible? Where you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Because it doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. God says, ah, okay, you get to go. It doesn't work like that. Any more than you can go down to Angel Stadium, wear an angel's uniform, 
Sit in the dugout, bring your bat and your ball, and think that you're going to get to play in the game. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Why? Because you're not an angel. No one in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, not only have I attended church, but, you know, I, I've been involved in church. My last church, I sang in the choir for a number of years. I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People even thought of me as a leader. But the problem with that statement is, could you show that to me in the Bible? Because I don't see anywhere in the Bible that church involvement gets you into heaven, like whoever helps out the most, carries the pastor's Bible, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader. You get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth and not play games. What makes you think you're going to get to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, but I know God. I, I mean, you talked about the blood. I've heard about that before. And, and I could tell you about Christmas. I sing the songs every year of my life and, and, and Easter and the resurrection. I, I could quote scriptures and tell you stories out of the Old and New Testament. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you can do those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible where having head knowledge about who God is gets you into heaven? Gets you right with God? doesn't work like that. Have you read your Bible? The Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and can quote scriptures, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about your mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that makes you right with God headed for heaven and denying hell. Come on. Let's talk tonight. Sometimes people say, well, I can appreciate what you're trying to do, but you get to heaven your way. I'll get to heaven my way. We'll all get there some way. Well, listen, this is not about your way, not about my way, not about some well-meaning church committee way. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So what does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day. Now, let me tell you about this guy. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did good things all of his life. In fact, he, he became one of the religious leaders of his day. He held to the strictest form of the law. He would teach other people about God. This guy did good deeds. Man, people looked to him to find out about God, and, and they celebrated him. And, and, and yet, this great man that we would have thought was headed for heaven comes to Jesus and is asking this very same question that we're asking tonight. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? How do I get to heaven, he asked Jesus. How do I enter the kingdom of God? Now, Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, you're just doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you there. Don't worry about it. You got this. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does Jesus say? Well, he says, you must be born again. I know our society and pop culture has made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. But let's not listen to what society and pop culture says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, here's what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, he gave you all of his heart. He gave you all of his life. Now... In response, you give him all of your heart. You give God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to you and I in this church tonight. And what does he say? He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means, a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token for every now and again. An occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. You're not going to make it. How do I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 time out. If I raise my hand, I'll, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment 
than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. No one would make that trade. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. Listen, I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. But he said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on the cross, shed his blood for you and I, and was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? All across this auditorium, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on, tonight, don't leave unsure. Tonight, make sure that you're going to head for heaven and not hell. Finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can make a right relationship with God by simply raising your hand. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or down at the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Raise them up high. There's one right there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? You need to give God all of your heart. need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? Real quick. Oh, come on. I can't can't imagine that there'd only be one. Come on, who else tonight? You know you need to give God all of your heart, and you know you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Is that a hand right there? Are you pointing at someone else? Over this side? Is that, a, is that a hand right there? Okay, gotcha. Two. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? You can put your hand down, by the way. Thank you very much. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, I want to give you a moment. You need to give God all your heart, need to give God all your life. Anybody else? If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Come on. Go for it. God's speaking to you right now. Anybody else, real quick? Got two wise people already. Anybody else? Got you, number three. Come on, where you at, number four? You know you need to do this. Come on, where you at? Just pop it up real quick when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else, real quick? Anybody else? Thank you, number four. Come on, don't you know there's five? Five, you're just sitting there. You've been waiting. Come on. This is your time. This is your moment. Just pop it up real quick. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. But you know you need to give God all your heart and all your life. Come on, number five, real quick. Come on, where are you at? Anybody else? Got excited. He was putting his hand over. Anybody else, real quick? Number five, come on, just pop it up. Pop it up, pop it up. Where are you at? Don't hesitate. If that's you and you know you need to do this, do it real quick. One more, last call. Last call, and then I'm going to close this up. You're going to miss it. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, real quick, real quick. All right, let's give the Lord a hand for four wise people tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all four of you, or if you're number five, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap and a shout. We're going to sing a song as we do that. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Listen, God doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes into your heart when you invite him. And that's what we want to do with you in a moment. We can't do that until we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, let's all stand. And if that's you, you just come right now. Come down. Just make your way to the front. Grab your stuff. Get a friend if you need one. And you just come right now. Sure. All right, they're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on. Just make your way to the front. Come on, you can come too. Just make your way to the front right now. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Anybody else? Come on. Come on. We'll wait for you. Just make your way to the front right now. Amen. Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys have come. So excited for you. This is the best decision 
of your entire life. You already heard what the blood does. That's about to happen in your life. I want to introduce to you guys a friend of mine. See this guy over here? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really neat guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance so that you're not wondering what's happening here. First thing he's going to do is he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, free literature that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Simple steps, easy stuff that you can find out. What do I do now that I'm a Christian? Third thing he's going to do is he's going to offer you absolutely free what we call an SPT. What is that? Well, it's a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's a friend in church who will meet with you before church service and help to get you strong in the ways of the Lord. Meet with you about a half hour before church, get you a cup of coffee or something like that, and just sit down with you, answer any questions you might have, and go over some things that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.